Welcome to online service with South Norwood Baptist Church. We welcome you to worship with us today, whether you are a regular or watching for the first time. If you are watching on the premiere, then please by all means interact with us by writing in the chat, telling us where you're from. If you are watching maybe on another time, then please by all means contact us and interact with us via our website or on social media.
We welcome testimonials to demonstrate how God is working in your life. And I invite you now to listen to a testimonial. Good morning, church. When I look back and consider that what difference knowing Jesus has made in my life, um, I'm quite struck by a number of different things. Uh, firstly, I feel that I'm quite privileged to have known Jesus from a young age. Um, where I grew up, you had the choice of one school to go to. Uh, it wasn't like in London where you have to put, pick your five favorite schools. If you lived in a particular area, you went to a particular school and that school was a Church of England school. And although it wasn't very Christian, um, the vicar used to come every single Thursday to give a, uh, an assembly and I used to just believe everything he said, basically. Um, and so when he said we should pray in the morning and pray in the evening, that's what I did. Um, when, you know, he told us about God's love, I just believed that. Um, and just that was, I just thought that was just normal. Um, and then the Gideon Society came to school and offered everyone a Bible, well, a New Testament and Psalms, and said you can only take this if you promise to read it every day, uh, which I did. I said, yeah, I got up in assembly. I want one of these. I'll read it every day. Uh, probably since then, and I was probably 10, 11 then, uh, there's probably a dozen or so days where I haven't read the Bible. Um, and it's just been part of my life ever since I was young. During that time, uh, not all my family were Christian. My mum was quite into the occult, kind of witchcraft things, doing people's star charts and all kinds of different things, going down to Glastonbury to, to co uh, conferences and, and gatherings of uh, different occultic um, events. Um, but then when my sister was about... I think she was just around one. Uh, my mum heard a voice. She was sat downstairs on the sofa. She heard a voice saying, go upstairs and check on your daughter. My mum did, um, and Amy, my sister, wasn't breathing. Uh, my mum managed to revive her. We got her to the hospital. She stayed on observation for a few days, but you know the doctor was saying, this will never happen again. It won't happen again. So we're going to let her go, let her, let, let her out, she will be fine. The day that she was let out, my nan got through the let, uh, a letter box, a leaflet from the Cot Death Society saying, if anyone wants a um, baby monitor that will alarm, uh, will, alarm will go off if the baby stops breathing, let us know. So my nan immediately called them up. We drew, drove up from Southampton to Newbury that day to pick it up and it saved her life three times. And my mum just sat us down one day and said, God is looking after us. Whether you believe in God or not, I know he's looking after us. I've been involved in lots of different things. This is only God. And so we started going to church. Um, and for me, that was great. You know, it, 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 it kind of meant no more hiding my Bible away and reading it, um, it was it was brilliant. Um, and I think just from being a Christian from a young age, that really has uh, shaped what I wanted to do with my life. Uh, throughout my life, I've wanted to do things that have helped people, um, that tries to make the world a better place in some way. Uh, whether that's just working with young people, um, I used to do work on kind of the environment and climate change, um, and also kind of in my role now kind of teaching and teaching about youth justice is really very much grounded in uh, in kind of those things that I've, I found important in, in the Bible was growing up kind of about God's love for one another God's justice um, and I remember maybe this is going to tell people my political persuasions but I remember I was, being at, at, I was at a church when I was about 15 um, and one of the members of the church was going to stand for election as a conservative candidate. And uh, I, I questioned him. I said, how can you stand as a conservative and be a Christian? You know, capitalism, the selfishness, you know, the self-centeredness, that is against what's in the Bible. And he looked at me and said, well, we have our faith and then we have our work and the two are separate. 
And I thought to myself, I don't want to live like that. That's not for me. Whatever I do needs to be integral to my Christian faith. And that's what I've tried to do um, in everything I do. And, and, and it's led me to do various different things um, in my life. You know, one of the things I've been doing for the past probably about 15, 16 years is, is football coaching down in Tulsa. Hill. Um, and, you know, it's great to us, you know, great for me to, to help, you know, children out. We feed them, we, we coach them football, we help them with English and math, lots of different things. And, and during that time, we've had lots of challenges. Um, I think seven of our young people have been murdered. Um, many others have gone to, to prison. Um, but we also obviously see God's hand at work as well. Uh, one young guy that I used to get to go to, he, used to, he came to me and he was, I was coaching him from about the age of seven. Um, and I used to bring him to church with me. And, you know, he seemed to be going on the right path. And it was, it was a, a joy to see. Then he got excluded from school for carrying a knife. And then the year after... He was arrested for possession of class A drugs. Four days later, possession of class B drugs. Um, you know, making music, uh, kind of drill music and things. And it just seemed that, you know, he'd forgotten about God. Um, and it was almost like, where's God, you know, in his life? His parents sent him back to Ghana. They said, you know, we can't, can't have this. We're going to send him back to Ghana. Um, and... A few years later, he contacted me. He wanted me to be a reference. Um, he's trying to get on a, a, a master's course uh, for law. Uh, and he's making Christian music. And his life is kind of turned around. Um, and it's absolutely amazing to see God's uh, perseverance with people. And I think, you know, when I look back on my life as well, God has really persevered with me. I've done lots of things wrong. You know, I've had lots of ups and downs and the downs of generally being because I've done something wrong and God has been faithful uh, to me through that uh, and forgiven me each and every time and and I guess now you know reflecting on that that's the next part of my life where I think God is and, and knowing Jesus is making a, a difference that forgiveness that God has shown me how do I show it to other people and I think that's uh, where the next stage of knowing Jesus and the difference he's making in my life, how he's changing me um, to be more patient and more uh, forgiving and more understanding, just like he is with me. We are going to pause now to be led in prayer. Dear Church, let us pray. Father God, you are the awesome God of creation. You put the stars in their place. You created the earth, the mountains and the rivers, the seas and oceans. Father God, you created us and all life on this planet. And we just praise your awesome name. Father God, when we often look around our world, it can seem chaotic. We just need to flip on the news and see the situation going on in Afghanistan and Kabul airport at the moment. Those chaotic scenes as people desperately flee for safety and for refuge. And Father God, we just lift up this situation and put it in your hands. Father God, we pray for those that are desperate to leave Afghanistan. We pray that they have safe routes and are able to flee and find a new home, a new hope somewhere else. Father God, we pray for our own government. We pray that you give them hearts of compassion and that they open up and support those that are trying to seek a better life somewhere else in safety, instead of closing their doors because of political calculations of what will go well with the pollsters. Father God, we pray for the whole of Afghanistan as the Taliban take over. Father God, we pray that the Taliban, you just change their hearts. We pray that they will not be an organisation of terror and fear, and that they will not inflict the severe brutal punishments that we know that they are capable of. But Father God, we pray that you give peace to Afghanistan through one way or another. Father God, we just pray for that country and we place it in your hands. We also pray for Haiti, struggling from the aftermath of the earthquake, Lord God. 
We pray that aid is able to get to Lycaeus as quickly as possible. We pray also that all those people that are stranded at the moment will very quickly find help and security and refuge as well from these dire situations. We lift up Haiti to you, Lord God. Father God, we also pray for the coronavirus situation. And whilst in this country with the vaccines, it's starting to come under control and society is starting to open up, we know that this is a global pandemic and that there are many people across the world who are still living with the consequences of the virus. Father God, we pray that vaccines will be able to be reached out across the whole world. And once again, we pray for politicians, for vaccine manufacturers and distributors, that they don't focus on, on the wealthy countries, but that vaccines are distributed across the entire planet, and that this global pandemic will come to an end as soon and as quickly as possible. Father God, we also pray for our own community, South Norwood. We pray for our council, who are going through financial difficulties at the moment, Lord God. We pray for wisdom in them, and that they will constantly remember that they're there to serve the citizens of Croydon, and not the just trying to uh, balance the books. Father God, we also pray for our church. We pray for all those who are in need at the moment, Father God. But also we thank you for all those who are having a blessed time. Father God, we lift up South Norwood Baptist Church and Croydon Council into your hands. We pray this all in your son's name, Jesus Christ. Amen. We are going to have a Bible reading now. Our series is based around the book of Matthew and we are now going to hear from Matthew 19. Good morning church. The reading for this morning is Matthew 19 verses 16 to 30. Just then a man came up to Jesus and asked, Teacher, what good thing must I do to get eternal life? Why do you ask me? about what is good jesus replied there is only one who is good if you want to enter life keep keep the commandments which ones he he inquired jesus replied you shall not murder you shall not commit adultery you shall not steal you shall not give false testament honor your father and mother and love your neighbor as yourself all these I have kept, the young man said. What do I still lack? Jesus asked, answered, If you want to be perfect, go, sell your possession and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sad, because he had great wealth. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Truly I tell you, it is hard for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle and for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of, heaven, of God. When the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished and asked, Who then can be saved? Then Jesus looked at them and said, With man, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. Peter answered him, We have left everything to follow you. What then will there be for us? Jesus said to them, Truly I tell you, at the renewal of all things, when the Son of Man sits on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or fields for my sake will receive a hundred times as much and will inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last and many who are last will be first. This is the word of God. Good morning, everybody. I wonder how many of you like detective stories. I like old fashioned ones with authors like Agatha Christie, um, Dorothy Sayers, and Guyo Marsh, and so on. And I like not being able to work out the ending, well, not too quickly anyway. And in the stories that we've heard in this series, 
we know what the endings are and they are good ones. We might say they were all happy ones. And today we have an ending like some of the detective stories I like reading, unexpected. So we've looked at the stories of John the Baptist, of the Roman centurion, of the Canaanite woman and Peter, the disciple. And these were all very different people. And Jesus spoke to them all and treated them all differently. Jesus didn't have a formula for talking to people. Their needs were different and so was how he treated them. And though these four stories were very different, they did have one thing in common. They had faith. And this was shown in different ways, but it was faith. And today we have the story of a rich young man, an important man, a religious man, a respected man, a ruler in his community. And how was Jesus going to deal with him? Two weeks ago, when talking about the Canaanite women, Pete used three headings, and I'm sure he'll forgive me for using the same ones because they fit in. So firstly, the setting. One writer said, the story of the rich young man is one of the most famous and poignant in the Gospels. It's an important story. We read of it in three of the Gospels. And Jesus here has just begun his final journey to Jerusalem, where he knows he will face the cross. And there were lots of people following him and he was doing a lot of teaching. And a man came up to him and the crowd must have let him through so he could get near Jesus. So how did he manage that? If we read all the three stories, they're very similar, but there are some slight differences. And they're written, of course, by different people. And together, they give us a good description of what this man was like. He was rich, so his clothes and his appearance would have reflected that. He was a ruler, and that would have given him standing in the community. He was religious. And there was something else about him that only Mark tells us, and it's unusual. We read that Jesus looked at this young man and he loved him. And we know from his life that he was very upright and moral. And it's not very often that we read such a full description of someone that Jesus had dealings with and where we get such an unexpected outcome. And in spite of all the things that this young man had, he knew that in his life he was missing something. He wasn't satisfied. And although he must have known that many of the Jewish religious leaders wanted to get rid of Jesus, he comes to him for help. And Mark tells us that he ran to Jesus. He didn't want to miss him. And then he fell on his knees before him. And in the light of what we know about this man, that was amazing. He knew that there was something different about this man, Jesus, which made him do that. And in verse 17, he called him good teacher. This man was a Jew and in the Jewish culture of that time, material riches brought respectability. This man had that, but he falls on his knees before someone that in the eyes of the Jewish rulers didn't have it. And he says to Jesus, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And this on top of all the things that he was already doing in his life. And then we have the encounter. This man comes to Jesus and his encounter with him changes his life, but not as he wanted or expected, or as the disciples or the crowd following him expected. Unlike the other people that we've heard about, he didn't have faith. And he asked what seemed to be a simple question. What must I do to inherit eternal life? And two words give us the reason why this wasn't that simple. I and do. He thought that he could gain God's approval by his own efforts. And he had to learn that that wasn't enough. He was quite clear what he wanted, 
what he knew what was missing in his life. Maybe he thought Jesus was going to tell him to go away and do something, something he was able to do that would fill that gap that was in his life. And in reply to him, Jesus said that he obviously knew God's commandments. And from what we know about him, his life, his character, etc. People listening to this conversation probably thought, my goodness, this man's life is so impressive. What else is there for him to do? And Jesus says to him to keep the commandments. service. If you would like to find out more about our church or what it is to follow Jesus, then by all means, please do get in contact with us. I would now like to close in prayer. 
May we know the joy of Jesus and continue to share the work that he is doing in our lives. Amen. We are back next Sunday. The premiere service will start again at 11 o'clock next Sunday. So please do join us and please connect with each other in the meantime. Thank you very much and see you then.